Yes, sir. Oh, yes, they are expecting you. Would you like to come along with me, please? for you inside. Ah, oh, good. Hello. Now, we've asked you along here because we want to tell you the P6 story. And this is where the P6 will become a production line reality. Now, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to some of the men who've been principally concerned with it. This is Peter Wilkes, who's our chief engineer. Hello. Uh, Mr. Bash, who's head of styling. And Mr. Bashford, who's in charge of the design office. In fact, all of these men have been concerned with the P6 for some three years now. Uh, Mr. Garansky, who's our project engineer. Mr. Poppy, who is director of planning. Uh, in fact, this P6 project has occupied our best minds for, well, some three years. And also tied up literally millions of pounds of capital. And this is where it will come to life. Now, of course, it's just an empty shell of a building at the moment. But I wonder if you can visualize the scene in a year's time when the P6 is launched. Here's engineering geared to the years ahead. The P-6, or rather the Rover 2000, as it'll be called when the secrecy surrounding its development is over, is a long, low, sleek piece of luxury and precision. It's a zippy light saloon that can seat a whole family with all the Rover comfort. You know, the go-ahead sort of people for whom this car was tailor-made. Modern-minded people who are used to quality engineering. Discerning people with a bit of dash. Who are really going places. You can see already that the Rover 2000 is just the job to put other engineering achievements in the shade. There are all sorts of minor refinements. That extended grill for a higher air intake. And the famous Viking prow, elaborated so it stands out even more. But all that's in the future. We'd better go back to the past. To the day when S.B. Wilkes, the former chairman, and director Jock Backhouse decided just how many millions of pounds they would have to spend to take motoring so many years ahead and to realize this daring dream. The date? March, 1958 and sketched impressions of this dream take tentative shape as designers conduct a passenger space investigation, getting a rough idea of possible dimensions. The first quarter-scale model of an early P6 conception is made in clay. The first mock-up of the interior. You start inside to translate a dream to reality before you can make drawings from which a full-scale model can be built to show how your skin contours can fit the required engineering. It's complicated to start at such a project. It gets simpler later, only if you know exactly what it is that you're basically aiming at from the beginning. From models and drawings, you advance to the first handmade prototype. 
the base unit at the earliest construction stage. And from that, to a real live vehicle, complete with skin panels, which, as you'll see in this case, only shows you the inner structural panels of that important thing, the capacious boot. Bringing a dream to life is an endeavor that no one dare leave to engineers alone. This needs a high degree of styling, of comfort building, before your motor, however perfect, will fit in with the requirements of any realistic purchaser who will come along. And along with such factors as acceleration, near-perfect suspension, low petrol consumption and disc braking, you must plan a motor car that also gives luxury in the amount of luggage it allows you to take. What's the good of cruising along at over 90 miles an hour if the car isn't capable of carrying four of you in comfort with all the luggage you could ever need? In the styling department, they have built a 3-8 scale model for a better appraisal of final finished details. There's the engine to be, meticulously made of wood, to check positioning of such things as air cleaners. Only when the wooden mock-up has met design requirements can work start on the actual engine that will power the P6. Two liters, four cylinders, a lightweight engine which on the bench produces 100 brake horsepower at 5,000 revs a minute. With an overhead camshaft, they've cut the number of moving parts to give long life at high speed. Secrecy, the first prototype is tested on the private rover test track at the Solihull factory. But this isn't the Rover 2000 as you're going to know it. It's the first handmade approximation, the rough idea of a luxury car to be. There will be two and a half years of refinement, rethinking, and rebuilding before this, the final engineering prototype, goes out with it on the track. As one prototype phase gives way to a later concept, they've developed a new technique of mounting the windscreen, so that if need be, it can be replaced quicker than previously possible. Two and a half years of detailed thinking produced scores of such subtle innovations which transformed the original to this. Test on the secret factory track and tests on a giant roller rig inside the factory itself. Drums give a simulated road surface which can be adjusted to alter road conditions. They seem endless, the test to which you submit your evolving motor car when you're planning for safety and comfort and top performance and looking years ahead. The clutch, like every other component, goes on the test rig. To ensure top quality, you test everything that goes into the car to breaking point. to earn their place in the car that has been designed for all those years ahead. The dream now is real and tangible. The project is well underway, but still there are decisions that only the man at the top can make. A.B. Smith and A.J. Worcester. Men who've planned and coordinated the whole project, with William Martin Hurst, now Rover's managing director, 
and Chairman George Fowler. Morris Wilkes lived with the P6 project through five successive modifications of the original prototype. Brian Sylvester, the rover research chief, tells me that this suspension rig, the plumber's nightmare as they call it, has knocked pounds off the price of such a quality car simply by telling them in advance what they need for the superb performance they demand. It's the rover way of eliminating so much costly trial and error guesswork. It's the same with this roller rig, checking the D on back axle, which gives you a back seat ride completely unparalleled. We're at Myra now, the motor industry's proving ground, watching a late prototype which has whipped up to 60 miles an hour in just over 14 seconds from a standstill. We're doing 80, which is 10 miles an hour less than her comfortable cruising speed. She can top the 100 mark with ease. we've come to Maya is to see the 2000's four-wheel disc brakes in operation. Brakes unique in this class of car. Well, that's what we came to see. And you'll notice those disc brakes are inboard at the rear as just another cunning way they've found of reducing unsprung weight. Just see the 2000 on Pave the juddery cobblestones you find all over the continent. The independent coil spring front suspension with coil springs at the rear and the Dion axle holding the wheel square gives you, and I repeat it, the smoothest rear seat ride you've ever known. And how's this for road holding? There's only the one way to describe it. The Rover 2000 really is years ahead. But all the time, prototypes are out on the test track. Work goes on back at the factory. Rovers sent men to Bristol University to study ergonomics. Hence the strip type speedometer, which this fatigue reducing science shows is that much easier to read. For safety's sake, they've decided to have alternative toggle and rotary switches easily identified by touch. Styling goes on long after road tests have started. First here at home on challenging twists and hills in Lake District Drizzle. Built-in anti-nose dive linkage keeps the car level even during braking. It holds the road like nothing ever before it, while that to Dion back axle gives its tires something approaching life everlasting. It's superb suspension above all that makes this kind of performance on really bad surfaces possible. It's still cloak and dagger stuff, for this is 1961. You won't find the Rover insignia on it, and people who see this car of tomorrow in action are craning their necks, wondering what new continental model it is. That cryptic embellishment is part of the bluff. That's the last of them, the final phase of the prototypes. After phase one, the P6 acquires two more headlamps. Phase three gives a bigger air intake with sighting points on the front wings. Phase four 
phase four brings in stainless steel window frames, and then there's bonnet shaping for engineering reasons and for style. Still, the research work isn't finished. Experiments in electrostatic paint spraying for the skin panels proceed alongside the other trials and tests. And now, incredibly, we are dealing with the P6 no longer. This is a Rover 2000 off the production line and on the quality control test rig that each and every one has to face. And before you consider the intricacies of the production line, look at the new seats, a third the weight of any existing ones, a factor that makes 20 pounds saving, and injection molded glove lockers, softly padded. Now the base unit of the motor car is clamped ready for drilling, facing, and tapping attachment points for the skin panels and suspension units. The Rover 2000 has become a production line reality. In a brand new paint shop, the whole base unit goes into the paint dip. No spray painting here. The whole unit is submerged. A rare new measure in the fight that at last has conquered rust. Afterwards, it'll simply be tipped to drain. It'll only be eight, 10, 12 years after you've bought your Rover 2000 that you'll even recognize this years ahead benefit, the difference that a process like this makes to a motor car. It's a car a long, long life ahead. Remember that research work they did with electrostatic painting? Now every skin panel is sprayed like this, before waiting for the base unit it will join to be lowered, having first been underbody sealed, to the assembly line. assembly swings into position. That shell of a new building just built, where 15 minutes ago we first met the key men concerned, is now a busy, humming, scientific, highly organized concern. A production line conceived and planned and put into operation on principles which make every other production line in existence look a generation out of date. overhead conveyor shows us the way to the main assembly line. There's something inevitable, something remorseless now, translating all those ideas and dreams and innovations into high precision engineering reality. A luxury four-seater designed as a family motor car, which also gives a truly sporting performance. A car as economical as it is luxurious is on its way to you at a price that could never have been realized without the production line planning and the originality based on sound experience which has been pumped into this project through the development years. You've seen it all. The gear change, a 
And now the radiator block is fitted into the car that in anybody's language is years and years and years and years ahead. Never fumbled with a screwdriver to fix a fuse. Gadgets like this cut down working man hours and ensure efficiency. Before you know it, we're testing the engine and that four-speed all synchro mesh gearbox. They've schemed things so that you can correct any mechanical shortcomings in this car before ever the skin panels are fitted. So there's no question of damaging the paint. The wings are put on after those searching engine tests. It's only a detail, but look at that trim. Here really is hidebound luxury. That furnishing will be splendid and crisp when you're too old to enjoy the Rover 2000 to the full. This is routine, the storm test. One leak, and the driver would certainly be drowned as he sat there. And needless to say, a rover hasn't lost a single driver yet. And this might be you, driving your new Rover 2000. But it isn't. We're still testing the motor car of tomorrow. The way, without doubt, Nelson tested out his ideas. In fact, at this stage, it's the other cars on the road that we're testing. We're satisfied with it ourselves, and with good reason. All we want to know now is how the nearest also rands are matching up. Don't let me say another word. I'm unconnected with rovers, but I must admit, I'm prejudiced. You judge the 2000 and the other cars you'll meet in 5,000 miles of continental travel from Brussels through Holland and on. for any commentary, the Rover 2000 speaks for herself in motoring language. This car speaks out in terms of road holding quality, superb suspension, safety and comfort, economy and performance. And at 50 miles an hour, remember, she does 36 and more miles to the gallon. Her top speed's well over 100 and she cruises at not much less. But forget for a moment her brilliant performance. Just see how lovely she looks in a picture book place like Oberammergau. through the most haunting of French villages. You're looking at tomorrow's luxurious shape of motoring to be. Free ride, this, not a test. It's a concours d'elegance, with the Rover 2000 eclipsing the continental sea. Where's the discerning motorist who would ever choose anything else?
country of motor car connoisseurs. Where is a car to touch this dream we once knew as a P6, built with such strength round its base unit body cage, geared for performance, fast, luxurious and safe? Where's any other car cruising through Florence with face level ventilation from a large output heater that becomes a delicious air conditioner at the touch of a switch? leaning tower to the dizzy bends you find in Switzerland. This is a tough road trial that has resolved itself into a victory parade. It's on roads like this that the all-synchro mesh gearbox and the four-wheel disc brakes make all that difference. It's here where superb suspension turns what could be an ordeal into a delight. It's here where the scenery is unique and the going is really difficult that the Rover 2000's sleek look and keen performance both really tell. Yet back at home on the M1, you feel the same confidence. Take your case. You come here as a filmmaker and immediately you become a potential customer. At least that's as I see it looking into the future. But let's get back to the present, 1961. Well, that's the P6 story. Now for your assignment. We want you to make a film of it. All you've got to do is stand here, look back into the past a little, and then on into the future. The future of rover motoring. You do this, and the film will make itself. Airport at January morning, and the flag of A.K. Stevenson signals the London start of the 35th Monte Carlo Rally. The Rover 2000 of Costello and Cooper is one of the two rovers among 39 entrants which here begin their trek to Monte. From Oslo to Athens, at nine starting points all over Europe, more than 200 other entries prepare to meet the challenge of the oldest and justly the most famous rally of them all. At Reims, Ann Hall and co-driver Pat Spencer still have the time to check the route before their evening start. Competition foreman Tony Cox does a final check with Jeff Mabs on one of the three rovers starting here. Thumbs up, and shortly after 10.30, the last of the nine separate sections of the first stage of the rally has begun. For drivers Morrison and Sire, a preliminary taste of the official scrutiny and publicity spotlight that will follow them for five grueling days and nights. Close behind, Mabs and Porter. Experienced drivers, confident of their car and their ability, 
yet not immune to the sense of occasion which only French crowds, cameramen and a lady driver can inspire. Tony Fall having his first works drive in an MGB. The London starters enjoyed a less glamorous send-off. Heavy snowfalls and bitter cold presented an immediate test of driving skill. A useful foretaste of the hazards and conditions which were to come. At the port itself, the cars regroup in orderly formation. Casualties so far are nil, but the checks by each crew are nevertheless meticulous. Michael Frostick and Maxwell Boyd, the second rover team from the London start. the channel crossing is a welcome respite a chance to relax after an unexpectedly demanding run from London and a time for last-minute planning for the course to come to everyone's relief snowfalls in northern France had been light but as the London starters raced inland from Boulogne to link up with the route from Reims conditions worsened rapidly the preliminary route considered by many as an easy-going run-in before the tougher trials at Monte suddenly became difficult and dangerous. Starters from Reims found conditions unimproved when they followed, now just over an hour behind. And already the twin factors of time and weather were taking their toll. For Morrison and Sire, a caved-in boot. And at a service stop, Mabs and Porter fit studded tires to grip the ever-deepening snow. Morrison's accident had cost a complete rear wing. But as the panels on the Rover 2000 are detachable, the car was able to continue unimpeded. No trouble so far for Anne Hall, though later, an accident near Chambéry would cost her dear. As the cars move out towards Monte Carlo in the quickly gathering dusk, it's still anybody's rally. With the dawn comes relief for night-tired eyes and a peaceful prelude of the hard day's driving that lies ahead. Now, cars from Lisbon are converging on the route through central France to Monte Carlo. And this French-entered Porsche began its trip at Monte. With more than 600 kilometers to go, there can be no respite for tired drivers and overworked engines. But the placid provincial towns of the Massif Central, who've seen it all before, remain unimpressed. <laughs> Almost as busy as the rally cars themselves, the rover service vehicles dash from point to point. It's on these straightforward yet strenuous stretches of the rally, almost as much as on the tougher mountain circuits, that manufacturers get from their cars hard road experience upon which current innovations can be vindicated and future developments planned. For far better than any test track, rally conditions push cars up to and beyond their limits, imposing relentless pressure under the twin demands of time and competition. but unbroken, Morrison and Sire begin the final run to Monte with time still in hand. In fact, for all the cars, the easier conditions of southern France and the rather generous schedule of this preliminary stage mean that as they reach the checkpoint at Avignon, the pressure can be eased. For road-weary nerves and cramped, tired muscles, a welcome relaxation.
It's fairly easy, the road from Avignon to Monte Carlo, which leads to the end of the rally's first stage. But even so, of the 192 cars which started, only 150 qualified for the stiffer test to come. The 900-mile parkour come on. The next morning, they started on the roads that would take them from Monaco to Chambéry and back again within 24 hours. A classic twisting route of snow and ice divided into 14 stages, including five special sections, flat out and against the clock, with the fastest man scoring fewest penalty points. could hardly be a greater test for car or driver than these treacherous roads. And disdainful of the weather, the Rover 2000 of Morrison and Sire held its own on the slippery snowbound slopes. On this vastly more difficult section of the rally, the towns through which it passed were more alive to the excitement of it all. The rowdy arrivals of successive cars were head-turning highlights, each one an occasion. Really heavy snow soon took its toll. Italians Fabaloli and Volpi got round the mountains, but missed a time control and were disqualified. And they weren't the only ones. It is in these conditions that the smaller cars can claim advantages. But the strain is still immense. Raymond Baxter and Jack Scott lost 18 minutes on this section of the rally. Skill, luck, stamina, and a length of elastic kept Cooper and Costello out of trouble and in the race. Not so fortunate were journalists Frostick and Boyd following behind. Eventually, they accumulated an hour's lateness and were disqualified. Melted by the sun, the snow slowly disappeared, but black ice kept the roads perilous. On the open road, the rally reverted to a race against the clock. A struggle to maintain the needed 60 kilometers an hour average eroded by the mountains and the snow. Gabrielle Renault and her co-driver came through to qualify, despite the loss of two wings at a cost of 30 penalty points. As cars began the descent that would take them to Monte for the second time, the complete character of the rally had changed. Only the well-known regular rallyists remained. The fair weather merchants and also rands had given it best and were headed southwards on less demanding roads at less hair-raising speeds. The Porsche, Boucher and Schlesser and the Nielsen's badly buckled Volvo would be among the 60 who would qualify for the final and formidable Epreuve Complementaire. First to Monte on this and the final stage, the mini of Timo Mackinen and Paul Easter. With the car surviving virtually unscathed, this was unquestionably the fastest combination of the rally. In third place in the overall results of the parkour commun, the Ford Cortina of Sweden's Bol Jungfeld. The Nielsen's privately entered Volvo continued the rally despite crippling damage. Of the 157 cars that set out, 88 returned. Of these, only 60 qualified for the Epreuve Complementaire, a punishing mountain circuit famous as the fighting climax to the rally. Drivers have a day and night to recuperate before they start again, but the cars themselves cannot be serviced or repaired until the rally recommences. For Michael Frostick and Maxwell Boyd, the rally is already over. But as motoring journalists both, there's still plenty of work to do. For many drivers, Rano Altonen and Timo Mackinen, the first inklings of the massive disappointment that was to come. But 36 hours later, controversy is for the moment forgotten. 
and the rover of Mabs and Porter is ready to face the final terrible challenge of the mountain circle. For television and the press, just as much for the teams themselves, all that's gone before can be dismissed as mere preliminaries. The end of the Monte Carlo rally has begun. More than ever, time is important. In the freezing cold, tension rises at the control points along the circuit. Pushed almost beyond endurance, men and machines struggle to meet punishing deadlines. The desperate efficiency of mechanics, the impatient despair of drivers, and the rally is relentlessly resumed. morning, battle-stained and weary, they were back. Three minis and a Lotus Cortina ahead of the field. But through a much-disputed technicality, they were disqualified. For previous Monte Carlo winner, Paddy Hopkirk and his team, a bitter disappointment. Although Zazada's car finished comfortably, it was Jeff Mabs and Jim Porter who won for Rovers 10th place in the revised results and the distinction of being the first British car home. A further credit to Rover's long list of achievement in the toughest motor rallies of the world. disc brakes on all four wheels. So it looks good and performs well. What is this about the Rover 2000? The suspension is mounted on the strong base unit, like all the mechanical parts. Why is it safer than any other car? The steering box is mounted high up and far back on the bulkhead. In the event of a front-on collision, the steering wheel is not driven rearwards. In the event of a rear collision, the occupants are protected by a steel bulkhead placed between the boot and the passenger compartment. Yes, but what about avoiding a collision in the first place? The rover's stability and immense cornering power derives from many factors. The Didion rear suspension ensures that the rear wheels remain upright at all times, thus offering the greatest tread area to the road. And radial ply tires are standard equipment.
tight weather, the upright wheels make a real advantage of the fact that radial ply tires are fitted to the car. They maintain their grip because the whole area of tread is always in contact with the road. Well, fine. That's very impressive. In both engine versions, the 2000 and the 3005, the standards of safety are identical. And the seats of the Rover are all manufactured for headrests. These prevent disabling injuries when the head is jerked back in an accident situation. Ha! My brother-in-law. The Rover company has instituted an extensive research program in the cause of safety. Many of the safety features incorporated in the design of the Rover 2000 have been the result of tests conducted here at the track of the Motor Industry Research Association. Complex instrumentation is attached to the dummy to measure the forces exerted on him, or a man in a real-life situation, when the car hits an obstacle at speed. So what's the hammer for? A means of ensuring for the engineer that the instruments are working properly. But there are other reasons for crashing in a car. It is the only way of proving that safety design really does serve its purpose. Of checking, for example, that the steering wheel is not thrust back more than can be allowed towards the driver. Yes, well, I reckon you've That the petrol tank does not break free, that the seats remain firmly fixed, that the car behaves as it should behave, with as much protection as possible for the occupants. Over a period of years, the careful analysis of crashes like this must go a long way to producing a car that is intrinsically safe. The difficulty is finding drivers of equal capacity. <laughs> I like that. That's really disheartening. It is worth noting that the Rover engine does not penetrate the passenger compartment, that the dummy is still harnessed in the rear seat, but as expected, the petrol tank, which is mounted away from the possibility of damage caused by a rear collision, is firmly secured, on principles normally found only in aircraft. Well, that's great. But the seatbelt is the biggest single safety feature in any car. Without one, in an accident, the driver will be thrown forward at the speed of impact. That's it. That's what we... A graph which shows the force exerted on the steering wheel can be created when the situation is reproduced in the factory. And the deformable structure to which the steering column is mounted is one of a whole range of projective ideas in the rover. The fascia shelf will collapse at a certain impact, the severity of impact measured by the ultraviolet recorder. The glove compartment is collapsible to protect the knees. Do you need all that with the seat belt? This represents the knee of someone who won't wear a seat belt, or who wears it too loosely. So. Now I know. Seems like I asked a dumb question, you know, at the beginning. This is the exhaust gas analysis test. A programmed set of instructions are given to the driver, and gases are analyzed to check that they don't contain more than carefully controlled proportions of carbon monoxide and hydrocarbon. I believe you. The instruments are set just below the driver's vision line, so that he does not have to take his eyes off the road for more than a moment. Good ventilation and real comfort for four people. You've sold me, you really have. Completely safe and yet detachable harness anchorage points. A special rover design of harness that allows easy movement. All-round visibility, the windows being large with narrow pillars. Fine, fine! The front seats are freely reclining. The steering wheel can be adjusted for rake. Panels are attached only at the last stage. This means that the base unit can be completely immersed in the anti-corrosion bath, 
so that its inbuilt strength never deteriorates. And the panels themselves are not damaged or scratched. <laughs> You've really got a great car there, thank you. Four headlights. The driver can see at a glance that his side lights are on. The trafficators are easily seen by other motorists. Hey, hold it, Gearing hold disc it. disc brakes on all four wheels. Child-proof door locks. No sharp angle or protrusions to cause injury inside or outside. A warning light to signal when the brakes are 